नमस्कार वी वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू मैनेज कृषि गांधी नॉलेज लेक्चर सीरीज ऑन फोर्थ फेब्रवरी टू थाउजेंड दिस इज सीरीज नंबर नाइन एंड टुडे वी हैव रेस्पेक्टेड ऑनरेबल डॉक्टर अनिल के गुप्ता सर टू गिव ए सेशन ऑन ग्रास रूट लेवल इनोवेशन एंड रीचिंग द लास्ट माइल so before uh, we request our director general to introduce uh, the today's uh, chief guest i would like to give a very brief about uh, uh, about this series uh, manage uh, uh, organizes krishi gandhi knowledge lecture series uh, by eminent persons from varied fields of agriculture and development to motivate and inspire the professionals uh, both in agriculture and other allied uh, sectors and uh, this uh, uh, series invites outstanding personalities to manage to share their knowledge essence through live lectures to the faculty members trainees students uh, and uh, faculty members of uh, uh, all uh, invitees from all leading institutions in the country and uh, also uh, seva members and manage facilitators the manage krishi gandhi knowledge lecture series is recorded in video films and it is uh, uh, shared through manage youtube and also through uh, through the link is sent to around more than 1 lakh extension professionals in the country and also abroad and uh, <clears throat> this also goes to different state departments faculty members of agricultural universities samitis extension education institutes scientists of kvks agripreneurs non governmental organizations and public at large anybody can view it uh, from uh, youtube each se session really inspires many of the people and also the especially the last mile extension worker so this is the uh, very purpose and spirit of uh, the manage krishi gandhi knowledge lecture series now i request uh, uh, dr chandrashekhar director general manage to kindly introduce today's speaker sir over to you thank you dr jia good morning to uh, everyone uh i would like to extend a warm welcome to all to this very uh, interesting talk uh, it is my privilege to welcome today's esteemed speaker uh, professor anil kumar gupta uh, to deliver a talk uh, sir thank you very much for your valuable time and we are very eager to uh, listen to you but before that a word about uh, uh, our organization manage uh, national institute of agricultural extension management is an autonomous organization under ministry of agriculture government of india uh, we are mandated to uh, carry out activities like training research consultancy policy advocacy international program education documentation dissemination and uh, implementation of several government of india programs for strengthening agricultural extension systems in the country uh, two things i would like to highlight uh, in a year uh, through various programs we are reaching around the 50000 stakeholders across the country through various programs of manage and partnership is the strength of uh, uh, this great organization we are also called a concept nursery in agricultural extension several innovations have been conceived pilot tested and upscaled at national level for implementation uh, sir two important programs may be of interest to you uh we are the nodal agency for implementation of agri clinic and agri business center scheme where unemployed agriculture graduate is trained and given a financial support of 20 lakh rupees and a subsidy of 36 to 44% to start his own micro enterprises agri enterprises at village level to provide value added extension services to the doorstep of the farmers i am happy to share with you sir we have trained more than 76000 unemployed agriculture graduates 5 to 6000 every year and uh, we could establish 33000 uh, micro agri enterprises in different parts of the country that is one thing second one we are also a knowledge partner to ministry of agriculture for promotion of agri startups under uh, rkby raftar program and uh, we are working with uh, more than uh, 900 agri startups Uh, spread across the country uh, about krishi gandhi actually our extension worker lives in the village he address day to day problem of farmers but rarely get connected to 
the outstanding extension professionals at national and international platforms. The very purpose of this talk is to link the global national experiences with the last male extension worker. How it happens? Uh, Professor, you are going to address maybe 50 limited invited audience here. The same thing is converted into a film edited and transmitted to more than a lakh stakeholders within the country and across the country. Uh, that is how we are uh, promoting the, the thinking of, uh, you know, invited extension uh, speakers. Now it is my uh, responsibility privilege to introduce today's esteemed speaker. Um, I'm very happy to share that uh, Professor Anil Kumar Gupta is also agriculture graduate and he did his doctorate for in management and for more than 36 years, uh, you know, he is associated with Indian Institute of Management, uh, Ahmedabad and uh, actually his name goes parallel with the National Innovation Foundation. Everyone in the country knows about National Innovation Foundation and he's the founder of National Innovation Foundation. So basically he dedicated his life, entire life for ensuring recognition, respect and reward for grassroots level inventors and production of their intellectual property rights. For this purpose, for every summer and winter, he walked in the nook and corner of the country in villages uh, for more than 6,000 kilometers to identify the grassroots level innovators through Honeybee Network. In fact, based on his experience, he wrote a very interesting book called Grassroots Innovation, Minds and the Margin are Not Marginal Minds. A very interesting book. Probably all our colleagues will be, uh, you know, uh, certainly after this talk, will be eager to read that book. Uh, in fact, he want to demonstrate that the ideas and knowledge of economically poor people are important for the sustainable progress of developing countries. This is very important statement for all the extension functionaries listening, viewing this important program. And professor occupied very important positions. Uh, in fact, he was uh, chairperson of research and publications of IIM Ahmedabad, chairperson of Ravi J. Matai Center, for Educational Innovation and Kasturbai, Lalbai Chair in Entrepreneurship, is co-coordinator of Srishti. He was speaker in uh, TED India and he is advisor on several issues on innovation, environment and sustainability to uh, several organizations. Uh, considering his contribution, received several awards. Important one is the highest civilian award of uh, uh, our nation. Uh, Padma Shri Award, uh, Professor was awarded during uh, 2004. Uh, uh, professor, you are uh, uh, better proud for all the agriculture fraternity in the country and an inspiring personality. And uh, Science in Society Award from Indian uh, Science Congress during 2004, Asian Innovation Award and uh, Pew Conservation Scholar Award from uh, Michigan State University. This is in brief introduction of uh, uh, the esteemed speaker. Professor, over to you and we are eager to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, friends, uh, I'm so happy to be with you today through the manage, which has, as I learned, uh, have known for a long time, but it was wonderful to hear that it reaches to more than a lack of extension workers. And I'm trying to reach you all because uh, 700 districts, 650,000 villages of our country obviously cannot be treated uniformly. So they all have diverse ecosystem. And I took this picture of a leaf, which is uh, slowly withering away. The last mile of this leaf is composed because that's where it has to dissolve itself into the earth. The tragedy of our time if I can say so, is that it is the soil that we forgot to take care of over all these years. How do our grassroots innovators, conservators of biodiversity, people who develop new solutions for solving problems, and the great thrust that has been put on natural farming, 
how has honeybee network and grassroots innovation network tried to address the concerns more than 35 years ago is something that i will tell you briefly i also hope that you would uh, appreciate more than ever before that there is a lot of lessons that we can learn from common people and uh, uh, dr chandrasekhar mentioned the director general of management mentioned that we have show the after i will talk about it a little bit but you know what do we do actually in the network in the hanvi network we look for the crazy ducks like this so all the four are going in one direction the one is moving in an opposite direction this is a photograph that my colleague namika took from thor lake and i'm very enamored of this photograph because it conveys very precisely what we need to do if we want to sustain our production systems our conservation our biodiversity we need to look for odd balls yeah. we need to look for people who don't conform who are deviants in some sense positive deviants who have the courage and conviction to stand up for what they believe in if they believe in diversified systems so it be if they believe in that they can develop their own varieties of crops so it be i mean we need to recognize that oddity and through the walks in different villages different parts of the country we try to look for such people so we have walked in every single state of the country from andaman island to gorej valley and uh, anantnag in jammu kashmir not every single state more than once many some more than twice but at least once every state and that connect to the common to the creativity at grassroots level has brought several lessons which i will share so what i'm trying to do is to change the context of farming systems of extension of communicating with farmers so that the content of our communication our learning pedagogies changes you know many time we use the term people poor people are at the bottom of the pyramid they are at the bottom of economic pyramid they are not at the bottom of knowledge pyramid they are not at the bottom of ethical pyramid they are not at the bottom of innovation pyramid so that is the first context we should change that poor poor people may be poor economically but they are not poor in their brain in their mind and this is that it is that knowledge that i would like to highlight that we can why are we not more hungry than we are actually to learn from the common people so my appeal to all of you my friends is that if each one of you picked up one lesson a year a year we will have 1 lakh lessons learned from common people every year can you imagine a country more hungry than us in learning from the creative people of our society i think this is my mission today if i can convince you all to listen learn and leverage listen learn and leverage the lessons that you find people from people's experiments from people's innovations from people's own creativity i think our agriculture sector our rural development sector will be transformed beyond imagination and we can do that all together we can learn many things we can learn object about objects we can learn as i would mention a little more detail about concepts about new ideas that people develop so we were in uh, anant nag shodhi yatra 2007 67 67 and we carried innovations from kerala to kashmir literally so there is a tree climber here as you can see developed by apachan late apachan and this girl from his school wanted to try it herself in anant nag kashmir valley to see whether she can climb and she did now this is the power of networking that we can cross pollinate ideas from one region to another from kerala to kashmir literally and we should give a sense of belonging to all parts of our society and the world at large because we can learn from anywhere similarly you see here a cordon pot maker you know that we are concerned about pollution we are concerned about the plastic microplastic and all of it which goes into our ecosystem and cordon pot does away with the need for plastic bag for nurseries 
Gopal Bhai Suratiya, who developed this, has been selling not just parts, but also these machines fabricated by Paresh Bhai Panchal, another innovator who has partnered with him. So there are, there are so many examples of objects, we will discuss them. But there are also examples of concepts that people have developed. So during one of the Shodhi Aptas in Kutch, uh, arid west of Gujarat, after a farmer, her, farmers heard me for about half an hour why we should avoid chemical pesticides. I'm talking about 1998. So one farmer got up and said, Professor Gupta, we understood what you're saying. I said, what am I saying? Tell me. He said, you're telling us that the plants which animals don't eat are potential source of herbal pesticide. Oh my God, I took half an hour to talk. This farmer had the wisdom to compress that into one sentence. I couldn't have put it better. Now this message can be applied everywhere. It's a universal principle, not just in India, not just in one part of India, because universally, anywhere you go, Africa, Latin America, wherever, and if you find plants which animals don't eat, why they don't eat? Because they're toxic. What do I need for pest control? Toxicity. Why do I need to buy from market? Why can't I find it in my neighborhood? And of course, the dosage will have to be tailored because we don't want too much of toxicity. We don't want it to be there. If there's a residue, we don't want it on the vegetables that you eat directly. So all those precautions will have to be taken. But the question is very simple. The biodegradable solutions are available to us where we are. So I think the one of the frontier of extension science and extension practice today should be, and I wrote this paper in 1987, transferring science for development and diffusion of technology. I wrote it for Ismar the Hague in Netherlands. Transferring science for development and diffusion of technology. We have been transferring technology for all these years. But I'm giving you examples, how people develop scientific understanding. So let me give you another example. Now, you, we know that when the swelling of wheat is done in, let's say, mid-October to November, every week's delay in swelling leads to loss of production. So we, give, we say October mid, or we say first week of November. But we don't tell what kind of humidity and temperature is required. How do we find humidity? Take a wet cloth, put it under the open air in the light and under the sun, and the time it takes for drying will give you the humidity level. Very simple, measurable, quantifiable, exact. Temperature, we can take it also. But we, we think farmers can't understand temperature. They can't understand humidity. Of course they can. They deal with it all the time. And there are several indicators that they use. So my suggestion would be that we should now start talking about transferring science, transferring concepts. And I'm giving example of the concept that I have learned from farmers. So let me talk about second concept, slow irrigation. Pick up any book on irrigation management and show me a chapter on slow irrigation and fast irrigation. Have you heard about slow irrigation? So we were talking to a farm worker, Walla, in Jamnagar, and uh, there was a farmer who had developed a Risham Pato, a variety of uh, chili, but we were interested in talking to the farmer, to the laborers who were actually cultivating it, actually growing it. So the farmer said, all right, go and talk to him. So Walla was a young boy, and we said, okay, tell us, how do you transplant chili and what do you do? He said, sir, first of all, I transplant it the seedlings with the left hand. Left hand? Why not with the right hand? Because left hand has less power. The roots are very fragile. They should not, they cannot go too deep. I don't want to sow it too deep. So I plant it with my left hand. All right, that's interesting. And then uh, I give it slow irrigation. I said, what do you mean by slow irrigation, sir? Since I told you already that the, the roots are shallow, and if I give fast irrigation, that seedling will fall down, they will lodge. We will not get production out of it much. So how do you ensure slow irrigation? Sir, if the bed size is bigger, the water will dissipate in the larger area, it will be slower. You make the bed size smaller, the amount of water will reach faster. My God, that's interesting. I had not been taught as a student of agriculture about slow irrigation. Let me tell you that. But now we all know about drip, 
we know about various other technologies where we are using this concept. But how do people who were for here, eons ago, decades, centuries ago, they have developed this concept. And here's a farm worker. Now, third point I would like to tell with you. A farmer knows a great deal about his or her farm. One set of farm, maybe in several plots. But a worker works on several farms. One farm worker may work on 10, 15, 20 farms. Who has more knowledge of farming? Let me tell you, ask me. And where have the extension workers focused on learning from farm workers? I appeal to all of you, my dear friends, at least few days in a month, please listen to the farm workers. They have rich insights. We have learned so much from them because they work on many farms. They compare and contrast. They look at what this farmer is doing, what that farmer is doing. They look at why somebody is doing better than others. And therefore, learning from farm worker is no less important. And I think time has come when there must be a paradigmatic shift in the pedagogy of extension. We should try to use new concepts, new pedagogies, new ways. Let me give a third example where how farmers observe very critical aspects of sustainability. And if we learn that, we learn new concepts. For instance, in pigeon pea, which has generally yellow flowers, Yellow flowers attract pests. Dulabhai, in one of the villages of North Gujarat, observed a plant with a red flower. He was curious. This was odd. Out of millions of plants, one plant he observes which is different. So he tagged it, collected the seed next uh, after the harvest, blew it separately. In few years' time, he developed a separate variety. Apart from the fact that it matured early, gave him advantage of selling pigeon pea pods as vegetable and got more money, the fact that it had red flowers was me implied that there were much less pest attack on it. Now, we all know that when we use traps, uh, we use different color, strips of different color, put with wax or whatever other attractant for the flower, for the pest. So color plays a role in attacking pest is known to us. But the same concept can be applied to have plants with different flowers, colors, that we have not heard a lot in the literature on the plant protection. So what I'm trying to say, that, and I can go on because there's so many concepts that I have learned from farmers, which I and my colleagues in the Honeybee Network, Gyan and Srashti, all the, both the institutions, and then I have National Innovation Foundation. The three institutions that we set up. I'll talk about it time permits a little bit more. So it is very important that we should understand that not just farmers but farm workers, not just practices but principles, we can learn from them. And then comes the issue, can we learn processes? What kind of processes people follow in their farming system that can teach us something valuable? So, let me give you a very interesting story of Harbhajan Singh from Hisar, Haryana. So, he realized that, a, you know, cotton crop takes about 60% of pesticide. 50 to 60%, one crop. And I'm reiterating that our country is now moving towards natural farming because it wants to reduce the consumption of pesticide and fertilizer. And I'll talk about it in a minute with more detail. But important thing to note here is that water, if you give more irrigation, then the nutrients get leached. So whatever fertilizer you have given, even that is not available to the plant. Much of it goes down. When you give more water, these, the leaves and the stem is more succulent, which has more moisture. Insects find it easier to nibble at it. It's easier to cut at it. It's easier to eat it, easier to attack it. So there's a correlation between more fertilizer, more water, more pest. So what did Arbhajan Singh do? He said, I will give first attack experiment he did was, and uh, Kamal taught me about this, uh, alternate row irrigation. So first row, third row, fifth row, those gone. Second time, second, fourth, sixth. Half, 
the water level, water consumption has gone half. And interestingly, you can do this experiment in your own farm. In your, you can persuade some farmers to do it. They're small. With 10 cents, they can do an experiment. Don't accept what I, anything that I'm saying. Do an experiment, prove me wrong, or if you find it right, I'll applicate it. Very simple. It's, these are all open source solutions. All the databases of Honeybee Network are open source. So, half the water. Then what did he do? Second time, he said, all right, let me put the, give the water in between the two roads. The purpose was to reduce the consumption of water, reduce the leaching of nutrients, reduce the succulence in the plant, reduce the attack of the pest itself, and therefore save the money on plant production. Once we were traveling in Srinagar and we found that people had grown uh, suva, you know, this is um, a relative of uh, cumin. And uh, very interesting because it attracted pest, the predators. So once uh, in 19, I think, 83, we were doing some study in the Mahindragar district and we found that uh, farmers had grown coriander around a chickpea field. So we asked them, why did you do that? Sir, it helps in controlling pest. Helps in controlling pest. Oh, sir, it, it may be repelling. I said, all right. So I told it to Michel Pimbert, who was at Ecclesiat at that time. And I said, why don't you do some experiments? And he did some experiments for three years. And he found that a coriander, which is a nectar-rich plant, attracted the predators of the pest. Sometimes farmers can do right thing for wrong reason. Farmers can do right thing for wrong reason. We should not deny the validity of an information, of an idea, of an innovation, just because the rationality, the reason given for it is not appropriate. Of course, it did not repel. It attracted the predators, predators killed the pest. Consequence was right, pest was being controlled. So it is very important that we realize that uh, how by uh, learning from the farmers, different concepts can be learned. So there are two different dimensions of grassroots innovation, innovation from the grassroots and innovation for the grassroots. And I'm hoping that scholars around the world will like to work with these farmers, both to expand their repertoire of new concepts, new technologies, but also to expand our own understanding to develop frugal, circular, inclusive, and affordable, accessible solutions. We should realize that many times the material constraints, as I said earlier, is not a necessary condition for triggering innovation, but voluntary suffering is. I internalize the pain that you're going through, which is called in our language, some Vedana. Some is equal Vedana means pain. When I consider or treat your pain as mine, from that some Vedana, for Swanta Sukhaya, for my own happiness, I develop solutions, certain shield. That is empathetic innovation. Most grassroots innovations are empathetic innovations. When Mansu Bhai Jagani, 92, a mechanic in Amreli, uh, was talking to his friend who came to him and said, look, I can't keep bullocks anymore because fodder is a constraint. I can't afford a tractor. What can you suggest to me? He said, and he, his friend was sitting on a motorbike. He said, leave your motorbike here. I'll convert it into a plow. And then he made a detachable device, Sati it is called now, more than 200, 300 innovative fabricators are they're fabricating this every year, about 10,000 of these pieces. Now it's called Sanedo, uh, it was called Handio and also Sati, uh, developed, attachable to the motorcycle earlier, now to the, to the uh, chassis. And this man, one person developed a frugal solution because he internalized the pain of his friend who had a, he did, the mechanic didn't have the problem. The problem was with his friend, but he internalized that problem, thought through it, voluntarily suffered that problem and came up with a beautiful solution. So of course, when you sense the unmet need, you have inertia on one side, initiative on another side, our grassroots innovators distinguish themselves by innovating and bridging the social gap. 
I will go, this is what I was telling, the Samvedna se Sajam Shilta, how do we create innovations out of empathy, out of, empathy is not exactly the word because empathy is for others, Samvedna is within. And look at now the other side of the coin, coin where inertia is there. I mean, this lady is breaking the Bhagwa seed with a stone 10,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago, she might have tried to do this. And the same solution continues because we couldn't design good nutcrackers. And there are many such problems. So what does Honeybee Network do? Giving voice, visibility, and velocity to the creative and innovative people in formal and informal sector. A nameless, faceless person comes in contact with the network, gets an identity. So you must have seen this year, Nadi Kattin got uh, Padam Shri from Karnataka. A maverick innovator. In fact, we published several articles of him on him on Honeybee Newsletter, which comes in several languages. And uh, he was a maverick innovator right from a childhood. He was not, he was, he often got late for going to school. So he designed a very simple contraption. Uh, he took an alarm clock, tied a thread to that. Thread was tied to a pot of water. So when the alarm will uh, start, the thread will be stretched and the pot of water will throw the water on his face and he will get up. That is what he did as a school student. And from there, he went on doing different experiments, different solutions. And I'm so happy that he got, I talked to him a few days back when he got the news and we gave him Lifetime Achievement Award in 2015 at Rashpati Bhavan at the hands of then President Sri Pranam Mukherjee, Bhaz Ratna Sri Pranam Mukherjee. So look at this, a farmer doing something ordinary in a village of Karnataka, gets recognized, gets identified, and then all the way to the highest civilian award he gets. That's how Honeybee Network tries to give visibility, voice, and velocity to the creative and innovative people in formal and formal sector. And network is the way forward. Network is the new gold, I sometimes say, because uh, alone we can't do much. But 100,000 attraction workers, if they can network, and I wish that they would, they can speed up the transition to natural farming, sustainable farming, beyond imagination, I would again say. But by just sharing, and I will be very happy to work with manage on this, our network will be very happy to coordinate and cooperate with and collaborate with Jay and all her team because we think it is possible. It is possible to harness a lesson from each one of you. Each one of you. One lesson a year, I'm saying. You can have one lesson a month. In a month, if I have not learned a lesson, what have I done? And don't mind my saying this, but I'm going to say this. I tell my students, the day you are not surprised, you have not lived. You have just existed. Living means being curious and being said, oh my God, I didn't know this. That is the feeling one must get every day, if possible. And when that feeling comes, that means there is something new which I've learned. So I'm appealing to all of you that please speed up the process of learning from the creative people. Sometimes it may have to be tested, test it out, let other farmers test it. Please remember there's a simple principle of entrepreneurship in life. When the cost of failure is low, try. Don't wait too long. Don't seek too many opinions. Just go ahead. When the cost of failure is low, try. There are so many solutions developed by the farmers where if you try it on one line of a crop or some animals, we have developed so many solutions that people have developed for mastitis in livestock or for ectoparasites. Try it out. It can't do any harm. Try it out. You know, we were in Jalandhar uh, in a Gurdwara. We were sitting and there was a show the, during show the Atra of Jalandhar in Punjab. And uh, we were talking about livestock. So I said, uh, is there anything that you did for some of the common diseases? And you know, mastitis affects about 20% milk production of the country. It's a worldwide problem. Other get infected and then you don't get the milk properly and there's a pain and so on, bacterial infection. So he said, sir, if you feed two and a half kg of coriander leaf and also put a paste of it on the udder, 
you may get relief in about five days. And we did an experiment and we have established that this is what this works. Go in the two and a half kg. What is the cost? It's an edible substance. We all eat it. So there will be no side effect. Safe. Use it. And when we searched, we found that in Iraq, scientists have done work on this practice. So maybe Iraq also said independently discovered farmers, they've discovered. In our country, farmers discovered, but we have not made it a part of our extension advisory services. Please do an experiment. If it goes wrong, nothing great will happen. You can continue with your antibiotics and whatever else that you want to take. But if it works and low power solution, wouldn't that help the poor people who can't afford to buy too many solutions, too many medicines, and sustainable at the same time, healthy? And anybody, it's a DIY solution, do it yourself solution. So it empowers the people who may not afford costly solutions. So this is what network will do. It will cross pollinate ideas from one place to another and generate solutions. Uh, this is interesting because we saw that in Meghalaya, Chira Punji. And we asked people, why did you make a bridge like this? Uh, you could have made a bridge of bricks, of iron, of steel, of wood, of whatever, but why? natural root bridge they said sir first question that we got in our mind was we need to do something different something creative something which is which has low entropy that means no waste practically then we said all right what what would that material be so then we saw the roots of trees hanging on both sides of the river rubber trees so we said well that's a rope like structure we can use it technology but it can't be done alone, so we need an institution. So technology is like word, institutions are like grammar, organizing principle. And culture is like thesaurus, which creates diversity, which creates a variation on a theme. So please pay attention to the culture of creativity, culture of curiosity, culture of experimentation. Once that culture gets created, a lot of things will follow of their own. We don't have to do much. Our job is to tell these stories of innovators who have done experiments, sometimes successfully, sometimes they failed. But even failed experiment has a lesson to learn. And if we can put it complex of this all technology institution culture, we will create a sustainable system of managing the farm. Now farm and non-farm go together. When, you, when we uh, produce food, we have to cook it also. You know? And a lot of energy goes into cooking. And when you use heat, when you cook food, heat is produced. How do you use that heat? So here in Arku Valley, Jyoti Ben, what did she do? She had a shelf on the top of the stove and she will put panicles of paddy, harvested paddy, dried on the shelf. With the waste heat, which is going from the stove, the rate at which the husk expands is different from the rate at which the grain expands. Now, when she does the threshing of this heated panicles, the grain comes out much faster. She has saved her treachery. Look at that, converting waste heat using very good physics. Can you imagine the sharpness of mind which can think of how waste heat can be used to then Preheat the panicles and then thresh them. Wonderful. In Meghalaya, in the lady, she will have four shelves. Oh, on the top, of course, there's a seed bag. Fumigation will uh, not let the pest grow. So there he, they will cure the wood, which they use for trolleys. A lot of trolleys are used for undulated tract. They get become stronger. When you heat the wood, it becomes stronger. The Chirapunji has the 35,000 millimeter rainfall, so they put wood to dry or fuel, and they will put here cheese, meat, drying up, and of course, a bag on the top. Meghalaya also has these practices. Four layer, waste heat is not wasted. It, the heat gradient, the hottest air is here, then less heat, then less, then less, and all of that, Heat gradient is being used for functional advantage. This is science, good science, sustainability science. How many of us in our kitchen use the waste heat of our 
gas. We don't have a shelf on the top of our gas, cooking gas, where we can keep the leftover vegetables and fruits and so on to dry them and use them as snacks later on. We let that heat go to the atmosphere and heat the atmosphere. But not these creative people, not these creative people. So there are so many solutions that can be frugal, sustainable, inclusive, and they should be accessible, affordable, and available. There is no point in a solution that is affordable, accessible, but not available. That's why I'm a great supporter of open innovations, DIY solutions, and we can use them. Of course, we should overcome the exclusion in the our delivery system. We should not exclude the far flung regions. We should not exclude the sectors where, uh, for example, weaving, where uh, yarn is uh, used as a, for weaving. So certain handloom sector is one of the sectors which has suffered a great deal because not many innovations are taking place. So uh, there are many other sectors like that. Seasons, flood, people are not approachable. How do we do that? So in Bangladesh, we have floating nurseries, floating beds. You can't control the water, but you can make the water level. Water itself it becomes your farming plot. When, when, you, when you make floating nurseries, and you can transport these nurseries to from one part to another. You can grow vegetables and sell it. The social segments which get excluded, certain skills get excluded. And the structure of governance also. I mean, let's say if you have an extension worker for 1,000 people, 1,000 people in high population density will be in one less than a part of a village. But in Jodhpur, where 35 persons per square kilometer is the top population density, 1,000 people will be in many, many more kilometers. So we can't have the same norm of allocating resources in low option density region like mountains, desert, other regions, forest, and other and high density region. That is the structure of governance. It causes by design we are affecting certain delivery of services, and we need to think about it. Extension system must think about it. What kind of flexibility in design of delivery system that we will introduce so that we don't exclude people, don't exclude certain communities. This is the triangle we conceived in 1997 when Gyan was set up. Gujarat Grassroots Innovation Augmentation Network. One of the first incubators anywhere in the world for grassroots innovation, 97. And I'm very happy to report to you that it got, it shared the best incubator award in 2002-03 with IIT Madras when Dr. Kalam was our president. What does Gyan do? Innovation, investment, enterprise. Now you must have, uh, more of you are familiar with the Indian government's thrust towards startups, towards entrepreneurship. And I was so happy when the Director General Manage mentioned that they have been able to support thousands of micro enterprises. But we need tens of thousands, we need maybe 100,000 every year, not just 10,000. And how do we do that? First, we should realize that the creative innovator may not necessarily be a good entrepreneur. Innovator can't make two things alike. Generally, they are incorrigible improviser. They want to keep on improving. Whereas entrepreneur has to make batch by batch consistent progress. So sometimes it is well advised to connect innovators with entrepreneurs. The third party enterprise. Investment. Both of them may not have investment. Investment, not just financial, but also material. Our labs must like, become accessible. Our fab labs must become accessible. Our university agriculture engineering department should become accessible to these farms. Our polytechnics should become accessible. Our ITI should become accessible to these fabricators. Why can't in the evening all these ITs, ITI, sorry, and the polytechnics be made open? to our fabricators who want to try something new. Why can't we do that? There's a capacity already existing in the country. We don't have to create new labs. Just open them in the evening or on weekends. Let people come and work there. You can charge them a small amount and we can create some fund through which we can support this fabrication. That's what NIF does, mm -hmm. Organ does. So, so this is this the triangle of innovation investment enterprise is very important. Sometimes funds may come from, let's say, Andhra Pradesh. Enterprise may be set up in Haryana. Innovator may be from Kerala. Why not? Even globally, 
we transfer three technologies to Kenya, uh, a dibbler, a tractor, a small tractor, and a multi-purpose food processing machine by Dharambir from Jamnanagar, Haryana. The beauty of this machine is that it extracts juice, jelly, and whatever other things from fruit and vegetable, but doesn't crush the seed. Some of you might have experienced that when you take a juice of take out the juice of orange or lemon, if the seed gets crushed, the juice becomes bitter. So you don't want to crush the seed. But you can extract essential oil from the seed. That's what the multipurpose machine does. So innovator, let's say Dharambir from Haryana. Investment we got from an international agency. Enterprise was set up in Kenya. That is grassroots to global. G to G. G to G. I will appeal to all our global partners who are working with Manage to see this, take this message forward that grassroots innovations that India produces and many other countries do are accessible to all of you to use them. Some of them are IP protected. I mean, we have filed patents for more than 1500 innovations in NIF. 1500 innovations have been protected by NIF, including plant variety protection and so on. When we talked about IPRs way back 35 years ago, when Honeybee Network started, people wondered how can intellectual property rights regime be useful to poor people? And we made it clear at that time that poor people are poor, not in everything. Why, how can you take away the thing in which they are rich? What is the resource in which poor people are rich? Their mind. And even product of that mind, if it's taken away, what will be left with them? We were the first to talk about patents for poor. And we have proved that it can work. But we have no hesitation in saying that patents cannot be allowed to come in the way of diffusion. So what do we do? We created a fund called the GTIF, Grassroots Technological Innovation Acquisition Fund. To acquire, first we use public fund to create private right, IPR. Then we acquired the IPR and made it open source. Why should innovators subsidize the society? Why shouldn't state or private agencies subsidize the society? So that's how this model was developed. Second model that Jan unleashed and it has become part of policy and we are, we are working with SIDBI, Small Scale Industry Development Bank of India. We develop Micro Venture Innovation Fund. You have microfinance all over the world. Microfinance is for goods and services for which market exists. Micro Venture Fund is for goods and services for which market does not yet exist. That's why they are innovative. Now, when you don't, know whether the market will accept your product or not you need you need risk capital how come that there is a risk capital for biotechnology risk capital for information technology why isn't risk capital for farming technologies ask ourselves this question yeah. so we created this formally first time in 1997 when we had iccig international conference on creativity and innovation at grassroots that was the time when we moved the concept but it got institutionalized in 2003 and now last year CB worked with Jan to get to this fund. But I would suggest that this fund should be at each district, actually speaking. Dr. Chandrasekhar, we should try to get such funds established in every single district. Risk capital, a small committee. We, I had, tried, I had uh, lobbied and we did create a district innovation fund, but it got sidetracked. And the Finance Commission, 13th Finance Commission had created this fund for every district, two crores but somehow it has not been continued, but we need to revive that idea. So what are we trying to say? The Honeybee Network triggers learning, especially they try to leverage. Jan tried to link innovation, investment, enterprise, and I have tried to do legitimization of this because then I feel a part of uh, Department of Science and Technology now, is a part of the government. India is the only country where grassroots innovation are the part of national innovation system. And I'm so happy to say that at least 13 or 14 grassroots innovators have got Padma Award in the last four or five years, which other country can claim. And not only that, when we had the Festival of Innovation at Rashtrapati Bhavan, the innovators stayed as the guest of Honorable President at Rashtrapati. I've never stayed there, but they did for 10 days and were invited to all the functions. They also met the prime minister. They met the, they met different, different cabinet ministers concerned with their technology. I mean, this is the way country was, has been trying to give a message that your innovation matters. Uh, so what I would like to do today, 
I'm trying to unfreeze the imagination. I'm saying that these frozen things of our imagination must be unfreezed. Let the mind fly and let us learn as widely as we can from, I just want to give a small example of how challenge awards can be used. So there is a small experiment that was done during by Gandhi and I will only mention that he tried many solutions for improving the spinning wheel. He failed, failed, failed. And then he tried something interesting in July 29. He awarded, he set up an award of 7,700 pounds, which was 1 lakh rupees at the time. An innovation challenge, the first innovation challenge for our country and for, for that matter, Asia and Pacific. Uh, someone who will design the new kind of spinning wheel. Why can't we identify the unmet needs of every district? Why can't we issue the challenge awards? And I would appeal to manage that. Let us take the 50, the 100 aspirational district, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Let us identify the key challenge, at least one challenge from each of the 100 aspirational district, 114 aspirational district, and announce an award, which can be, people can submit ideas to solve those problems from within the district or from anywhere else in the world, I would say. Gandhiji did not restrict the announcement only to the people from the country. He said anybody can apply. He only put a condition. You can have patent also. But if you want award money, you have to transfer the design to Khadi Priyog Samiti so that we can make it open source. That was the only condition. If you want award money, you may try to make your design open source so that we can diffuse it widely. But it's a matter of detail how we do that. But if this country wants to become impatient with inertia, impatient with inertia, then we can't wait for slow process of incremental changes to help us to reach where we want to reach, to become a developed economy. We will have to speed up the process and challenge awards can be very powerful. In fact, you, some of you might be interested in knowing that during the COVID period, uh, US government announced $500,000 award to redesign the mask. Because when you, read, when you have the mask like this, and you put the spectacles, you know, the spectacles become foggy because of the moist air which goes from the north. So they wanted to overcome all these problems. They must list it down all the problem with the current designer mask and they wanted people to come out. $500,000 award was announced in 2020 for redesigning the mask, simple thing. Now, if USA can do that, why can't we do that? We have enough money. So, Dr. Chandrasekhar, this is something which I will strongly appeal that they should try, at least for the aspirational district to begin with, take up one major unmet need. For example, Dhimachi has very high rich, uh, iron rich water. How can we design a better water filter for them? Similarly, there are, uh, um, uh, Alwar has very high, very large number of Arusa plants, other to growing on the roadside. Why can't that become the global hub of cough syrup? Himachal Kangla has large number of curry pata growing on curry leaves growing on the along the irrigation tracks. Why can't that become the largest supplier of vitamin A and other nutrient-rich curry pata powder to the whole world? So how do we make you know this concept which has come in this budget and also before that one district, one product? This is the time to do that. Look at the abundantly abundantly available but underutilized or not utilized resources. The advantage of working with the abundant resources but unutilized resources is that poor will not be excluded. Whenever you take a scarce resource as a beginning point, poor tend to get excluded, but we will not like them to be excluded. So that can be one strategy. So this is what came out in 1931 when Gandhiji was in Bartha jail. He had this spinning wheel from the challenge board. So that's how the uh, solutions work. Uh, what is the method of recognizing innovations? Method, material, and application. Old, new, old, new, old, new. At least one of the three dimensions should be new. Either method should be new, material should be new, or application should be new. So, as I directing, which is a compound expected from neem, by known method, known compound, but when it is used for growing hairs on the body head, it is new use. When you use a plant pesticide, it is an old use. 
So new application of a material will become uh, innovations. Please think about how do we, it's not very difficult to find innovations. That's what I'm trying to say. And delivery system. So we have many databases, Techpedia.in has engineering projects. We have uh, almost a million uh, abundant patents for free use by anybody and everybody. Uh, this is, of course, Zandra. You know about this Malaysian story. There's a film made on him, how he designed uh, a, warning, a winding machine, 10th pass person. These are different kinds of modification of these motorcycle based plowing machine that I mentioned to you by um, Mansu Bajigani 1992. And now for a cotton field, you can also have this kind of NDO. So a lot of solutions are there. Many products have been developed on people's knowledge. Before I conclude, let me say a change not monitored is a change not desired. I wrote that in 84 and I still believe in it. The change not monitored is a change not desired. 100,000 extension workers to me are appearing to be a treasure trove of ideas, innovations in all of the country. And doctor, we really need to tap their energy, their they connect with the people, they connect with the communities and harness. Persuade them that please learn, listen, leverage and legitimize these innovations for our country's growth, but the whole global growth. I mean, we'll share this knowledge with everybody and then we can try to develop a whole range of solutions for our people. We have this competition, HBN Kriya at honeybee.org or HBN Kriya at gyan.org. GIAN.org. This is the competition for innovations by anybody. And last year, we had 2,500 entries from 87 countries, and we gave award to eight countries. I would very much wish that we work together on this also and see how we can recognize, respect, and reward the creative innovators of our country. So let me just close by saying. Uh, this is how the journey began. Creativity counts, knowledge matters, innovations transform and incentive inspire, but not just material incentive, but also non-material incentives. And not just individual incentives, but also collective incentives. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, there's a paradigm shift in thinking <clears throat> soon after your session, sir. How minor little things really matter a lot uh, for the farmers and uh, uh, the global society at large. Uh, so now the session is open for discussion. So I we welcome any questions, clarifications, impressions. Sir, Namaste, sir. Namaste, Namaste. Anil Gupta, sir, uh, I met you in 2016. Please, sir, please introduce yes, yourself. I was a FDP student that time. Okay, okay. Sir, nice. in the uh, innovations and grassroots book opening, I was there with you. Yes. Again, yes, I'm yes, looking yes. on the screen. I'm very happy, sir. Uh, yeah, your session is very live and very informative, sir. Uh, again, I'm uh, that book I'm uh, reading. Uh, it is very useful for me, sir. I purchased it that day only. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Sir, uh, very inspiring and interesting talk. I'm sure that many of the talk will make many of us sleepless. You just to share share with us your Shodhyatra course. Uh, you told you uh, offered it to uh, IM students. What was the response of uh, uh, the students? Well, there are so there are two different things. One is a normal show the Atra where anybody can join, which are held twice a year. But there is third show the Atra, which is in autumn, where I take students to Himalaya. And uh, you know, by now this course has become the most difficult course to enter into because there are 500 students, and I can only take 25 Indian and five exchange students from abroad. So we have only 30 seats. So it becomes very difficult for students to come in. But let me explain that why do students want to take this course when their life most likely will be spent in metros and big corporations and so on. And the reason I suppose is that they realize that at one time in their life, they will be asked this question as to what have they made a difference to. And at that time, they will have to understand that uh, 
the richness of our society, our culture, our biodiversity, our institutions, all of that they would not have had any chance to learn from. So during this Shodhi Yatra, they, they go to Himalaya, different parts of Himalaya, Lahul Spiti, we have been, Mizoram, Murlin Forest, we have been, Radak, all, of, all, of, all parts of uh, Sikkim. And uh, we try to close the gap between our standard of living and the living of the common people. So they have to suffer voluntarily during this week. They come to suffer in this course. And I think that message is important. Gandhiji used to do fasting, voluntary suffering, even for the mistake that others did. And I think it's a powerful tool. I strongly believe in that when we can't stand up to our own expectation from ourselves, we need to take up an answer. And supposing we can't find one idea in a month, we should ask ourselves, what is happening to me? My, uh, why am I not being able to look at odd boys or the people? Is it possible <clears throat> that I have, in one month I did not find anybody who was trying, trying to do something different, something novel, something creative? So I think uh, Shodhi Yatra is essentially to learn from four teachers, teacher within, teacher around, teacher in common people, teacher in nature. Four teachers from whom we try to learn. And uh, I'm very happy that many of these students have felt that it has ignited in them a desire that they can be useful to those people who desire who deserve them but they cannot desire them you know mm -hmm. many times there are people in our country who deserve our time our energy our contacts our social capital but cannot desire it how do we connect the elite of our society <clears throat> to the common creative people so that we can mobilize the social capital and ethical capital and intellectual capital of these different arms of our society yes, sir. Uh, you made very uh, important statement uh, that, uh, you know, when the cost of failure is very low, what prevents us from uh, failing? Exactly. I think this fear of failure is preventing everyone to uh, open before other people, even though innovations are lingering in everybody's mind. Uh, as an institution, I strongly feel that we need to institutionalize the right to fail because by thinking uh, something which uh, fails, we are not going to lose anything. It's a, uh, we should call it as an experiment of thinking. Exactly, exactly. So my suggestion is that in your magazine or journal, whatever you have, publish every month few stories of failure. Ask essential workers to send you the things that did not work. And when they mention, they send those articles, they should give their explanation, but also the explanation of the people. And sometimes it may not converge. They think that it failed because uh, they did not try enough or there was no subsidy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it may not have worked because people might have felt it was not appropriate sometime. It may not be relevant for them or so on. So I think it would be a good idea. You know, the <clears throat> said developed topic culture long time ago, some of you might know. It never diffused at all. Dr. Varmani and his team spent 10 years and millions of rupees on that. It was a glorious failure. When I was a member of the jury of Tata Innovation Award in 2009, and there was an award they gave for glorious failure. Award was given. You know, Radha Tata was there, you know, and this award was given, in our, and we were the jury, Dr. Kasturi Rangan, myself, and one more colleague, three of us were the jury members. So I would say that it's a good idea. It's a very good idea that you picked up this point, and we should give awards that we should celebrate glorious failures. When we tried something very hard, it didn't work out. Maybe some of our assumptions were wrong. Maybe everything was right. It was before, before the time. Sometimes good ideas don't grow because they were before the time. When we started on sustainable agriculture 35 years ago, it was not the right time. Today seems to be the right time. <laughs> you know? So yeah, yeah. It, is, it, is, it makes a difference. It makes a difference that sometimes ideas don't work because they were before time. But there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it, it, how can we not argue that when you are taking 32, 32 nutrients from soil and you only supply NPK, how can it work? I mean, zinc became deficient, molybdenum became deficient. I'll tell you a small story about how sometime it takes long, sometime it takes longer for the facts of life to be accepted. Uh, I was talking at the World Food Congress uh, CFTR a long time ago, and I gave an example of some parts of Africa where uh, they had high incidence of arthritis. 
So they did a study and they found some villages where there was no arthritis. So they did a contrast and found out the reason. They found that wherever local varieties of maize were eaten, there was much less incidence of arthritis than where hybrid maize was eaten. And you know why? Because local varieties of maize could mobilize four times more boron from the soil than hybrid maize. And boron is very important, plays a very important role in metabolic pathways for arthritis. Now, this is an insight. If we deplete our soil, today almost every house has somebody who is suffering from arthritic pain, isn't it? It has also become an epidemic. We are responsible for it. We have depleted our soil of all the necessary nutrients, except one or two or three. And the result is that our health expenditures have increased. So how to link health with agriculture? And this is the time to do it now. I mean, natural farming has got a policy attention after a long, long, long time. I'm so happy about it that the budget included a, a special allocation for that. It's the right time for us to populate <clears throat> these messages that soil health, I did a study on soil health, animal health, uh, crop health and human health. Uh, we did a study of villages with chronic diseases in Panchma health with the help of 15 doctors and scientists from Anand Agriculture University, animal scientists, soil scientists, agronomists, 30 people worked together and did this study voluntarily. We had no money for that. And we found that copper seemed to help in discriminating the people who had more chronic disease versus less. Now, we all know that crop, we, we, we were advised to drink water in the copper pot, you know, in our ancient time, our families. But we never realized what role it plays and we found empirically only one mineral which explained the difference between two was copper. So this is the time when more such studies need to be done and link soil health, animal health, crop health, and, animal, and human health. So the people begin to see the connection between the, the entire ecosystem and sustainability. Agriculture is the prime mover of our health. So yes, I think we need to take this idea forward about failures and celebrate failures. It is a good news. In fact, uh, based on Honorable uh, Prime Minister's uh, uh, announcement on uh, natural farming, Government of India recognized managed as nodal agency for uh, implementation of and also knowledge repository for implementation of natural farming project. We have constituted a, we have received official communication from ministry and we started working on that. Wonderful. First, we are pulling all the good practices from different parts of the country. Because uh, uh, the good practices are there in the villages, not in universities. Uh, and we are just trying to pull all these things. And first step is made by manage. Uh, this is Wonderful. just for your information. I'm so happy to hear this because then my talk has not gone waste. I mean, today <laughs> it, would, it would certainly help your mission. And I'm so happy that it will help your mission because it is so close to my heart. And our all of us in the Honeybee Network feel very strongly about this. Because we spent yeah. our lifetime in looking for sustainable practices that people follow. And we have in all sectors, in <clears> livestock, <throat> in, you know, in, in, simple example. If you want to control ticks, an ectoparasite of livestock, cattle, and you keep on using chemical, various medicines that are available for skin treatment, this will go away and then they again reappear. So my colleague uh, in Gyan, they did an experiment and they found that problem is that unless you remove the four inch of soil in the barn where livestock is tied, the trees will keep coming because their eggs are there in the soil where the debris is. You don't clean the vet and you keep on applying the medicine on the animal, it will have effect, wet till they will come back. Now, tell me, this is a line and this is an ad, ad, ad insight that our extension workers, our animal scientists did not realize for a long time. You look at the extension messages on tech control and you will not find this advice in them, in the extension messages. But our Gyan team, uh, Anamika and her team, when they brought this lesson and they <clears throat> said that's so powerful, so effective. And we must remember this because science says that it is true actually, scientifically it is true. Entomologists will confirm this, but we have not paid attention. So there are so many such things which will improve the blending of formal and informal science. I'm not against formal science. I'm, I'm a great believer in that. But I think both of them need to stand, to appreciate each other's strength. Then natural farming will succeed. I think we should also realize that natural farming is not a slogan-bound movement. It is science-based. It has to become science-based movement. 
good science will generate good practice. To say that one cow can sustain the entire uh, farm of a farmer, nonsense. I mean, let us not get into those hyperboles. We should be very carefully doing experiments, showing, yes, we need microbial inoculation in our soil. We do need organic compost, no doubt about it. But we need many things more, and we need to be ready to accept them. And one solution will not work for the whole country. Please appreciate that. It's a very diverse ecosystem, and we should try to have location-specific solutions. But failures will be very important. We should not hesitate in reporting failures. Some experiments, I mean, you should, in the beginning itself, you should, the first opening remarks itself, you should mention in your letter that when we do experiments on natural farming, we should not hesitate in reporting failures because that only tells us what is not done, what is not feasible in one place. So that will make it more humble and more, uh, we will be much more open to learn from people. Because people know that, yeah, failure can happen. Otherwise, we, they will mask it. And then all kind of distortions will come in the system, which we don't want. Actually. So it's a golden opportunity for not just natural farming, but for uh, learning from people. By definition, natural farming would involve there are diverse practices, and we cannot do that without interacting with farmers. Uh, Professor uh, Anil Gupta said, uh, "I am Dr. Mahantesh Shirur, uh, faculty from Manage." Yes, so uh, I just have uh, two small questions. Maybe I, I just want. Uh, this was a very intense, uh, at the same time, very balanced uh, and uh, very calculated proposition, sir. You know, we all appreciate <clears throat> your time for uh, coming to manage talk series. Sir, uh, no, you told one important thing that scientists and the researchers should uh, stay in touch with villages. And probably I come from my Indian Council of Agriculture Research also. So we started this idea of uh, Mera Gaon, Mera Gaurav, uh, occasional visits to the villages once in a month. But sir, uh, I think, you know, in my personal opinion, we have reduced it to a formality and uh, we have lost an opportunity to you know, uh, get connected with the uh, grassroots innovations. And how do you uh, suggest us to make such policies uh, to, to find more uh, you know, uh, meaningful among the scientific fraternity? Because the moment the scheme was announced, uh, many people who were uh, working in laboratories uh, has started seeing it with a lot of contempt. And uh, that was one of the lost opportunity that I feel. And this, uh, the second question is, uh, no, Director General sir also mentioned that uh, we should encourage the fear of failure. But sir, before that step also, how do I overcome the fear of being seen with contempt when you have an element of oddity uh, within your personality or uh, some kind of uh, you know, steps that you take, whether you are implementing in a scheme or any of the activity that you do in your office. How do you overcome the fear of being seen with contempt when you have an element of oddity, which in fact is very good for innovation, sir? Uh, Mr. Shirur, I would tell you that for second question first, because I faced this at the same thing myself <laughs> in 80s when I started, uh, it was difficult for many colleagues uh, who were trained in most of the, most of them were trained in American universities. I was in a DC fellow and they were all Videshi fellow. And for them, it was difficult to believe that here is a professor arguing for learning from people and, and you know, uh, trying to publish. Uh, we started this uh, newsletter and after four years, uh, I'm telling this openly now, first time, I don't think I've shared this openly so much. Uh, the committee, policy and perspective committee of IMA met and they discussed the Honeybee newsletter and they said there are many things in this newsletter for which experimental evidence or scientific evidence is not available. So we should not put the name of IMA on that. So I said, all right, I accept it. So we then uh, said, okay, it will be published uh, from an independent source of such innovation, but we will have the editorial office at IMA, just as Computer Society of India Journal has an office at uh, IMA, we will also have an office at IMA, and they couldn't say no to that. But slowly and slowly, slowly and slowly, when we found more evidence, when we found uh, in 2000, we set up uh, an IF and had MOU with the ICMR, ICR later on, and also with CSIR. We demonstrated scientific validity of many, many, many solutions because there was a framework for that now. Apart from that, we also have a lab and fab lab. And we are setting up in Gyan also a fabrication workshop. So these kind of uh, empirical evidence started to give pay dividends, and it will become it became difficult for people to ignore. 
If Rashtrapati ji gave the award to somebody, how can you say it is not relevant? You know, after due diligence and all the export committees look at. But we developed, started giving recognition to farmers' varieties. We talked to the All India Coordinated Research Project for ICR for each, each crop. And they agreed to evaluate this. So for most of the agricultural technologies, we got evaluation feedback from ICR labs. And that was that reduced the hostility, so to say, among the scientific community. Coming to the first point, how do we trigger curiosity? I would say that if you uh, ask at the end of the day, share one thing which surprised you. Just one thing that surprised you during your visit, during your introduction. Did anything you saw around, not even you asked, just saw around, seemed odd to you? You found uh, a weed being harvested by the farmers. And I mean, her thesis did some study on certain weeds which were growing in paddy field. And there were songs about those weeds. Why will a culture conserve knowledge about a weed? Actually speaking, there's nothing like weed. <laughs> weed defines a plant out of its place. In nature, there's nothing out of place. So strictly speaking, they're companion plants. But if a culture conserves a plant, it must be very, very meaningful. So if edible weeds can be an important source of nutrition for midday meal scheme in education system in our country, why wouldn't we introduce that? You know, edible weeds are a good source of nutrition. So I think we need to ask the macrobiologists, why don't you pick up a soil sample from the richest spot in the village or from the least cultivated spot from the village and find in your lab what kind of cultures you are finding there. So we need to make it interesting for scientists. We have been bringing soil sample from our Shodhyatra and more than 8,000 microbial cultures we have in our lab. So I think this is something that scientists must find exciting. Scientists must find meaningful for their work. They must find that their work in lab and field becomes more meaningful. If they can find a variety which can grow with much less nutrients, which has much better bearing, let them, let them do the genetic mapping of that variety and find out what is the genetic basis of that behavior, which farmers can't do. How many farmers' varieties have been mapped? But incidentally, in uh, PPVFRA, uh, you know, in Chandrapur, a farmer who got who developed uh, HMT variety, he developed a variety called as HMT, and this variety has the thinnest grain as a standard for thinness in the descriptors of PPVFRA. That's interesting, isn't it? So we should take those examples where scientific frontiers have been expanded by the knowledge that people have produced and bring them in the classroom, make them aware to the known to the scientist. I mean, milk has a viral control. You know that in Andhra Pradesh, when they grow tobacco seedlings, they keep a pot of milk and put their hand in the milk after every few seedlings so that if there's a tobacco mosaic virus on the few seedling, it will not go to other seedlings. This is a working practice. Similarly for cattle, they do that. And I talked about it in, in uh, All India Conference on Plant Physiology and Biochemistry way back in 80s in Kotem. And Dr. Chari wrote a review article in NAB on use of milk as a viral control. And Manitoba, Ontario has an advisory on its website. Please look up in the today's on website. Search milk as viral control, viral control uh, in crops. And you will find the Department of Agriculture and Manitoba has an advisory which says that milk is as good as any other source of chemical agent that you can use for controlling this, uh, you know, uh, in, in rows and chilies, the TMV uh, virus, type 2 RNA viruses. Why would Manitoba put it on the website? You can find it today. So I'm saying that give those examples to scientists that look, there is a, the whole world is recognizing this knowledge, frugal innovations. And why will we ignore them? I think we need to do much more research to show them. I will be happy to support your effort in this regard. There was a book written in 1943, I have it, but it is published much earlier also, Fortune in Formulas for Farms and Farms in US. And they show that the soap made out of fat of different fishes is used for controlling different pests. You'd search on the net, you will find many farmers use soap solution to spray on the crops. What does soap do to the 
how, what happens to the insect body, ask entomologists to take a soap solution and do experiments on different soaps. They will find what it does. In Karnataka, when they, when they do the smearing of the uh, sunflower, you know, the smearing has to be done for better seed set. With a, they tie a piece of cloth on the hand and then they smear the flower. At that time, they keep a small needle with them. If they find a pest, they puncture it. That's it. Simple. Why would farmers do that? It makes sense. Because if you use any pesticide, it will affect the pollination. If it affect the pollinators, it will affect this yield directly. You know, isn't it? Yes, my dear friend. Somebody wants to say something else. Yes, please go ahead. Sir, I'm uh, Dr. Shahaji Fanda, uh, faculty here in Manage. Yes. In fact, uh, uh, it is not a question, but my feedback about your one session that I heard in 2016 at NIRD. And okay. uh, I remember uh, that time you shared some innovations that eggshell membrane that is are being used yes. for water filter. Correct. correct. And, yeah. And also the eggshell powder, if we dissolve it in vinegar, then the availability of calcium will be more for the plants. And really I'm using this te uh, technique, sir, still even now also uh, in my kitchen garden. Wow. And I'm getting, I got Why did you send me a mail on this? I, you know, when I get a mail of this kind, my day is made. So, sure, sure, sir. Dr. Shahaji, and I would be grateful if you send me a mail. I'll publish it in a heavy newsletter. But incidentally, yeah, yes. incidentally, I gave an assignment on this problem to my students to do a review of patents. Because this collagen, it's called collagen. The layer below the eggshell is a collagen layer. It is also useful for uh, wound healing. So if you have cut and something, then you can use that. So um, it's a protein and it's a very, very growth promoting substance. So I'm happy that you're using it and finding it useful. <laughs> very yes, nice. So this is another uh, information about the textual membrane now. And uh, even uh, today's session also, I, uh, one actually idea really touched to me that uh, considering this farm worker as an extension, uh, that means agricultural extension stakeholders, Correct. Uh, even our most of the program that is for agriculture officers, sometimes <laughs> farmers, but uh, this, this is really new thought uh, for us also. Considering okay, my farm is is you do one program eh, and give me a chance to meet those farm workers that you invite. You will be surprised by their insights. You will be enriched by their insight. I can tell you that. And I'm sure the country will be grateful to you for you, you know, for organizing this program because we need to change the entire culture of extension education in the country. Manage is the lead organization of our society, our country. You have to create new precedences, new pedagogic methods for our country to follow. And you just do that. And I can assure you that each extra worker who will come to your program would have at least met 15 farmers. So let's say you have 25 workers, 25 into 15. You know, that many farm information you will get in a session, in a workshop with farm workers. Plus, they will also tell you the wrong practices that farmers do. They will tell you why weeding should not be done too close to the stem of the, to the root of the plant. Which crop, how much distance should be kept for weeding? Give me one report, one, one advisory of extension where they have told you how much inch difference should be kept while weeding the crop from the base of the plant. Tell me, is that is it given somewhere? But you know that the roots of the crop will be spreading in the feed, some, some are adventitious root at least, and we need to follow a particular distance, particular gap, so that those roots are not disturbed. And ask the workers, they will tell you for each crop and sometimes for varieties. So, because they do weeding, and knowingly they will not harm a crop. So they have, they practice it. They practice it. Sometimes you will find some weeds growing around the stem of the crop, cotton field and generally, and you will wonder why that fellow did not remove it. That's the reason why he doesn't remove it. He can remove it with hand, but not with a device. He'll pull it up, but he will not cut it. So there's some very Dr. practical Dr. experiences that workers have. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah I'm Dr. Vasanta, working as professor at Extension Education Institute. Like, uh, uh, I would like to add one point uh, that is raised by Dr. Sahab, uh, sir. And the other day we have conducted one certificate course on uh, terrace farming, sir, in our EEI. 
So for which we have uh, invited many of the home garden practitioners. I was really astonished, sir, by seeing the methods and the natural leaf extracts the ladies are using and the harvests are bumper harvests. It is just out of our imagination. So in that manner, they are harvesting just with the available products, sir. So the actual uh, the sir was pointing out that is also one of the techniques used by one of the practitioner, and it seems uh, it it gives a lot of protection from uh, different pests that uh, she has mentioned, and also it uh, promotes uh, uh, what do you call new leaves stem girth also it is increasing so many things she has uh, pointed out sir not only this from the moringa leaves from the mango juice from so many extracts are there, sir. Just only using that without using a drop of pesticide, chemical pesticide, they are reaping bumper harvest. Doctor, really? sometimes you can send me a mail with their name and photograph. We will publish that. We will publish with due credit to you as a oh. scout. So we publish oh. with any information with the name of the scientist and with the name of the farmer because they get they need to get visibility all over the world, not just in India. And our yes, sir. That is correct, sir. large number of countries in the world. So we will be very happy to publish with due acknowledgement of uh, all the stakeholders in this process. Kindly do consider that. Sure, we'll sir. <clears throat> sure, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am Ajay Sara from Nagpur. Yes, uh, I think uh, it's an illuminating uh, talk by Dr. Gupta, sir. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, apart from natural farming, which uh, I think uh, our Honorable Prime Minister has envisaged to scale it up uh, throughout India for empowering the farming fraternity, especially small and marginal farmers. Uh, one thing on which I'm working uh, with dedication is how to enhance uh, the farmer's net income realization apart from crop growing. So I'm working on uh, carbon farming, you may say uh, carbon credits and all. And for that, uh, I had uh, referred some of the bulletins from the Australian counterparts, which uh, they are promoting and propagating regenerative agriculture practice. And the mandate is uh, sequestration of carbon, atmospheric carbon, and reinstating the broken carbon cycle. So I think uh, this also can be embedded in uh, the natural farming uh, mission for the farmers fraternity. One of the problems which uh, we had uh, noted that carbon sequestration certification and uh, its credibility, all problems cannot be attained with smaller land holding but having said that the government of india has targeted to uh, go for or formulate farmers producing companies fpcs or fpos 10000 uh, numbers so i think uh, amalgamation of the farming fraternity small and marginal farmers especially uh, they will empower they will be empowered to uh, have in fact, in uh, fact there is a very interesting provision in the budget for agroforestry yes, and you know, when the new growing plants, particularly forestry plants, the carbon sequestration is much higher. In the equilibrium yes. forest, there is no carbon sequestration. You are emitting as much carbon as you are uh, absorbing. So therefore, yes. new growth forest, that means agroforestry, is a very powerful way of carbon sequestering. And it is obviously generally promoted in the dry regions, but also some of the subhumid regions, depending upon, you know, the coffee and all of these now. There is a lot of controversy recently on the forest survey, and you might be remembering. But the point remains that for carbon sequestration, anything which is growing for a given period of time is absorbing carbon. And in addition to the energy and other benefits, I think your suggestion is very valid that if we also calculate the carbon sequestered by these plants, the farmer's economy may improve. And it's a very good point. And I think we should, the government has not yet probably incorporated that in the calculations of the benefits, but it will be very useful. I agree with you completely. Uh, with due respect, sir, another point which I want to make 
that uh, we have approached to several governments, state and federal as well, uh, to uh, give an access of waste or uh, degraded land. So on such land, we can have some reforestation or forestation program and adjoining communities, rural communities will be empowered to take care of uh, those plantations as per the designing of the programs with an objective to sequestration of carbon as well as to provide nutritional security to adjoining communities, uh, eliminating the uh, water pollution and uh, what not. Because now uh, the Lever Ganga project, which I think Honorable Finance Minister has mentioned, that uh, they are looking uh, for cleaning the Ganga uh, by creating about a, five kilometers wide stretch with a natural farming concept. This is one of the uh, missions. I think uh, those uh, lands, wasteland and uh, degraded lands, if government can monetize, not only they can uh, raise the uh, economy, but also empowers the communities adjoining with uh, socio-economic and uh, uh, ecological empowerment. So this is a, a, just a raw idea from my side. So we can deliberate the thoughts in a totality. Yeah, it, has been, it, has been, it has been discussed for a long time. And the reason is that, uh, I mean, given the fact that these are also pastoral lands, I mean, these are also used for grazing. Many times we forget that livestock in dry region constitutes the primary source of income, not secondary source of income. In the agricultural region, irrigated region, livestock is the secondary means of income. So when livestock is a primary means of income, you take away the grazing lands from them, they will be devastated. So I think you have to think of any model which includes the pastoralist, which includes the grazing communities, because it's a very sizable community. It provides high skins for our leather industry. It provides livestock products for our, and it provides dung for the regeneration of the soil itself. So my feeling is that we should not encroach upon these so-called wasteland. These are not wasteland. These are grazing lands. The term itself is wrong, actually. We should call them as grazing lands. And these grazing lands need to be made more productive by having good grasses there, central celeries and many other grasses. There have been experiments done that if you just provide rotational grazing, the productivity of these lands can go up. I mean, even normal circumstance, two ton per hectare is the minimum grass that you get. Yeah. Uh, product. And how many crops give us in poor conditions two ton per hectare. So therefore, these are not wasted lands, actually. It's a great tragedy for our country that we call them wasted lands. Just to just to add, it's very important to mainstream agroforestry with every individual farmer. See, they have a farm and there is a bund, actually. The bund is not used except for walking. It is not used. And they have farm boundaries also. A part of it is not utilized. So if every farmer plant you know, you want five plants. You just imagine. Uh, Not you know, five the, plants, sir. We should have shrubs on the. See, earlier in this country itself, farmers had shrubs on their farm borders. The birds which are browsing, like babbler. Now, babbler will go to the field and then, you know, pick up all the insects. And there are some birds which can pick up. You You may have recall that earlier we used a tea structure, a, a, a small stick with a tea. Uh, in the field where the birds can sit and then eat the insects. Now, we need those birds around us. Where will they perch? There is no perching price for them. So what you're saying is extremely important, but not just five. I mean, we should argue that we should have shrubs and trees wherever the shade is not going to affect the plant on the western side or northwest side, so that there is the, the light will not be affected adversely. But even if it is slightly does, the yield from the plants trees could be much more. So I 100% I agree with you that we have uh, we have not incorporated bird as a friend in agriculture and birds need perching places to be there to eat the insects. It's important to uh, give that recommendation in the form of a package of practice. I agree with you 100%. And what we can do is, Dr. Chandrasekhar, the best thing would be to observe those farmers which are still practicing it, collect data from them. And then demonstrate that, look, this is what this farmer has done and this is what his experience is or her experience is. You don't believe in talk to that farmer or visit that farm 
or do a small experiment, at least around one of the plots. And generally, two to two, three plots are there in most farms because of subdivision of the family holdings. So then they can do on one plot an experiment and then see the event. The results will be good. I will give you 100% on that. Sir, this is Vinita Faculty at Manage. Sir, your session was very insightful, interesting, and highly useful, sir. Sir, you, you in your talk, you have mentioned about uh, ensuring the uh, health of the crop, uh, animal, human health. So that is what eco-health system. So, sir, here at Manage, we are initiated it in the form of One Health concept, sir. So in Manage, we are now uh, they have uh, initiated this uh, one health concept where we are looking at the holistic health of uh, all the stakeholders in agriculture ecosystem. Sir, uh, I would like to know what are the uh, areas of research or study in this area so that we can explore on this uh, new initiative. On soil, crop, animal and human health linkages. You know, there were only two or three studies and I'll tell you these studies. One study was, was by uh, Professor uh, Girwani, Girwani, she was head of the home science department and then later on the vice chancellor of the Tripati Mahila Vishwa Dhyale, uh, and very close friend. She had done a study on uh, the, the nutrition, I mean, human and animal. See, what has happened is people have looked at human health, crop and human. People have looked at animal and human. But soil, crop, animal, and human, there is no study. We did that study because we wanted to demonstrate that you cannot de-link these four. Today, you are calling it One Health. When we did a study in 2009, and we didn't mind you without any grant from anywhere because we didn't have money. So we did it all voluntarily. All scientists, 30 scientists helped me. 15 medical doctors helped me because they had to take blood sample from the human beings through the ethical committee clearance and all that. So my suggestion is that involve the pediatricians, the geriatricians, I mean, get, what do you call that? Uh, the doctors who treat the elderly people uh, and uh, this the livestock scientist, the soil scientist, and the food scientist. So we need to analyze the food, not just for protein, ash, and other things, but also micronutrients. Basically, it is the minerals. You know, the famous scientist who got two Nobel Prizes, uh, one for vitamin C and uh, another for uh, that minerals are responsible for most of the health problem, mineral imbalance. So you must have read in COVID also, they are trying to talk about zinc, uh, calcium, vitamin D and all of that have been given to patients who are suffering from Omicron. So these are very important parts. We have not looked at soil mineral transposition to animal, both in the fodder chain and the milk chain, as the case may be, or goat, or uh, whichever animals are consuming it. Then the food from the field which they are growing on, they may be buying food, we don't want to take that. So the sample, if you want to do this empirical study, we can send you uh, our study, you can look at it, and then improve upon our methodology. We can tell you what mistakes we did, so you can improve upon them, and uh, involve the doctors, medical doctors who will do a baseline and then study and co convince the communities that why we are doing it so that, that we, we, we had a problem of volunteers at the time of human samples because some people gave, some people did not give. So sample size became a problem, but we can still handle this problem by convincing the community in the beginning itself that why we are doing it. So those communities which consume a large part of food from their own field could be one set and those which don't. And you can, we, we started from the chronic disease element. So we took the ASHA workers, 8,000 families were surveyed on, they reported information of the chronic diseases. And because in our country, the health data is only for infectious diseases. You don't get community-wise data on chronic disease, unfortunately. So we had to collect this data fresh. But if you collect this data, you can, demo, and then you, like to show the role of micronutrient, boron, manganese, calcium, molybdenum, uh, zinc, copper, etc., iron. And these, uh, the role of these minerals in the food chain, all through the food chain, 
both for livestock and human health would be very useful variables to study and uh, i'm very happy that you have taken up this area it needs intensive empirical research unfortunately there are no studies not many studies that i could come across zinc was one reported more long time ago because zinc became deficient zinc was the first tablet introduced after green revolution zevit was the name of the tablet one because the green wheat took a lot of nutrients but zinc became the deficient fastest in the punjab haryana and western up soils we know the consequence of that on heart and metabolic you know what happens so it will be a good idea to study there are some studies incidentally you should also take water because uh, one of the minerals one of the elements which uh, there was a study in sri lanka on where some, there were pockets where high suicide rates were found a lithium and they found that lithium content in the water was responsible for that phenomena so it is you know even bureau of physics we have a budget allocation for e mental health you know first time the country is taking note of mental health and you know that minerals have a role to play in the mental health itself so you should take those minerals also like lithium and others which have a role to play in mental health and it will be pioneering work if you do that i'll be very happy to support your work but it it's it's time that we do a good empirical research uh, i'll send you a lot of things that got in literature that we have i'll be very happy to send thank you so much sir it's, it's really very useful uh, the uh, points that you have mentioned we will take a follow your thing and we'll uh, and like to get your support as and when required sir sure please most well thank you sir thank you sir thanks for this uh, very enlightening uh, session sir actually it is uh, ideology it's an ideology for self development and also for agricultural extension and farmers sir uh, you spoke a uh, uh, lot about uh, innovation culture and uh, versus run of the mill uh, how you can trigger innovations how you can trigger thinking so that was uh, very interesting sir and how context changes the content so uh, how uh, how, uh, how timely we should be and then how contemporary we should be towards the problems and uh, sir one of the very interesting things that you spoke is about that uh, poor are not at the bottom of the pyramid but uh, only in economic terms they may be at the bottom but uh, as for intelligence and innovations are concerned they are at the top only Uh, that's uh, very interesting sir and listen learn and leverage and uh, trigger curiosity and transferring science for development and the diffusion of technology by giving uh, examples from the fields uh, that you made us understand sir and uh, sir uh, another uh, interesting thing that is uh, not just the practices but the principles are uh, important and uh, when the principles are generalized uh, they are universally applicable sir and uh, samvedana samvedana to srijana silata so that is the uh, innovation we we have to think about more than it is empathy plus and then you have to think about how you can create innovations and uh, visibility voice and velocity to innovations and also uh, uh, and also diffusion of innovations and uh, uh, sir uh, this one i think uh, we should also uh, tell to our students and children that is uh, the day you are not surprised uh, you just existed but not lived your life that day very so true, that means true. we should look forward for more surprises uh, from the Excellent. ecosystem that we are living Excellent. and uh, you also spoke about philosophy of gyan connecting the investors to innovators and uh, matrix of this uh, material method and application and also delivery of innovations that is interesting sir and show the yatra i think uh, all of us must be feeling about this uh, Uh, uh including this component uh, uh in the in the rave program sir the where the students of the final year uh, bsc they uh, go for the rave program i think a component uh, can be introduced in this and uh, sir your suggestions are uh, for manage are very valuable sir and uh, you also spoke about uh, our dg and you uh, jointly talked about the <coughs> celebrating the failures and the right to fail 
uh, that also I think gives a lot of courage to the scientists uh, to experiment on uh, uh, on uh, uh, on other grounds, uh, not uh, just the routine routine kind of research, but in in other areas, and uh, they can dig out uh, many of the problems and then look for uh, solutions. But at that at that time, if uh, a confidence is given that there is a right to fail, then I think uh, uh, the uh, science and technology will go in different. Uh, um, in different paths sir. and uh, surprises from the ecosystem enriches your knowledge and spend time with farmers and talk to them, listen to them and then uh, uh, learn and leverage and uh, legitimize. So these are very valuable uh, uh, sentences you spoke sir. And uh, from this uh, session, I'm sure that a lot of questions are raised in the brains of the audience. And uh, the way forward has to be decided and uh, built upon uh, by each of the audience uh, who is present here. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you, Dr. Shekhar. Thank, thank yeah. you, Jair. Uh, sir, on behalf of uh, Managed Family, again, uh, thank you very much for your valuable time. Very interesting uh, talk delivered to. I, I have got my benefit of my gift today. Uh, of a friend, I forget her name, who is going to take up one health experiment that is very close yeah. to my heart. Dr. Virita. I'm, also happy, I'm also happy that you are the nodal point for natural farming in the country. There are so many good things that I've come to know today, and I'm sure that there is a good uh, strategic uh, opportunity for us to join hands in certain respect and uh, help you achieve these missions with a great gusto and energy. Thank you so much and all the best wishes to you. Good luck to you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you.